The Real Scrooge We all know the tale of Ebenezer Scrooge, or do we? Uh, to my knowledge, at least 20 movie variations on Christmas Carol have been produced, along with uh, uncountably many stage plays and live readings over the years. The uh, classic story has also generated an astonishing variety of interpretations. Uh, as with most rich tales, the interpretations often tell us as much about the interpreter as a reading of the original story will. The Legend of Robin Hood, for example, is a really good uh, example of this, uh, varying and contradicting interpretations of the story. Uh, Robin Hood was the outlaw of Sherwood Forest, someone who robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. Now, if we take that interpretation, we're to think of the rich people as bad and undeserving, and the good people are the poor, the deserving poor. So what Robin Hood is doing with his uh, compulsory redistribution efforts is in line with a kind of Christian socialism. The rich, according to the Christian ethic, are supposed to be giving away their wealth to the poor. But according to socialist politics, since they're not doing so voluntarily, a forcible redistribution is justified. So is Robin Hood a Christian socialist? But what if that's the wrong way to look at Robin Hood? It might be, in fact, that what Robin Hood was doing was really taking back monies that had been confiscated by an oppressive government. And that government was made up of aristocrats, their cronies, and then brutal enforcers like the Sheriff of Nottingham. And so what Robin Hood is doing is returning the wealth to those who had produced the wealth in the first place. That would make Robin Hood a kind of proto-capitalist. He's defending property rights, limitations on government, and fair taxes. Of course, we don't know the real Robin Hood as the legend's origins are lost in the mists of medieval times. But with uh, Charles Dickens's tale of Scrooge, we have the actual text available to us to refer to. But uh, that has not stopped a flood of alternative interpretations of the, in fact, very complicated central character, Ebenezer Scrooge. So let me run through some, uh, some interpretations for you. We have Scrooge the villain, according to socialism. Socialism casts employment under capitalism as an oppressive zero-sum transaction. So here we can think of poor Bob Cratchit, Scrooge's employee. Cratchit is underpaid, and he almost doesn't even get to take Christmas Day off work. Now, Scrooge, the boss, he's a rich man. He could very well sacrifice some profits and pay Cratchit, the worker, more. But the supply and demand system cruelly gives employers the upper hand. It drives down wages, leaving exploited employees no option but to accept meager incomes. So, Bob Cratchit, he's a poster boy for um, oppressed employees everywhere. Now, there's also Scrooge, the anti-Christian. Out of simple charity, right? Scrooge should feel moved to help those less fortunate than himself. The many beggars in the streets, those who come asking for donations to worthy causes. Cratchit, his employee, uh, Cratchit has a rather large family with many mouths to feed and especially Tiny Tim, right, who's handicapped, you know, it tugs at our heartstrings. Now, Dickens's tale is in part a ghost story, and when the ghost of Scrooge's now dead uh, business partner, uh, Jacob Marley, when the ghost appears in Scrooge's bedroom, he cries, charity and mercy should be your business. So those top Christian virtues, accordingly, are what Scrooge really needs to learn. But another interpretation, there's also Scrooge, the savvy investor, friend to the economy, and homo economicus. 
contrarians will uh, sometimes take this line. They should argue, oh, Scrooge is not so bad. And we really underestimate his positive virtues. After all, Ebenezer is a great friend to the economy because what does he do in his business? Well, he's extraordinarily attentive to cutting costs and keeping prices low. He allows absolutely no unnecessary expenses at the office or at home. Every penny he saves is reinvested in new enterprises, and that provides jobs and grows the economy. And he's very good at it. He's successful at choosing investments that are going to be profitable, and he ruthlessly avoids those that are going to waste money. So he's efficiently allocating resources, he's creating jobs, and therefore he's growing the economy. So we should be giving Scrooge at least one thumb up. Another interpretation, we have Scrooge as environmentalist hero. Now we should note that Scrooge hardly uses any candles at all or coal, either for cooking or for heating his home and his office. Dickens tells us that in the winter, Scrooge kept, quote, a very small fire, unquote. Scrooge also wears his clothes until they are worn and threadbare. Scrooge is thus sacrificing personal comforts, and in doing so, he's preserving the Earth's resources. Now, if we are environmentalists, we condemn those who indulge themselves in comfort and luxury. And if we believe that the Earth's resources are scarce, then we believe that those who enjoy luxuries are doing so at the expense of others and the future generations, the selfish bastards. But notice that Scrooge is denying himself all comforts and luxuries, and thus he's leaving those resources for others to consume. How selfless. So we should thank him for doing his bit to combat global warming and conserving landfill space. He's a hero environmentally. Now, closely related to that interpretation is Scrooge the Malthusian fighting the scourge of overpopulation. The Reverend Thomas Malthus uh, had just a generation and a half before Dickens argued that human population was on the verge, its, its rate of growth of outstripping the world's resource base. And so overpopulation would soon lead to mass famine. But the character Scrooge, he tells us that he already pays support for workhouses, and in accordance with the poor law in England, he pays his rates in order to help those who are badly off. But beyond that, he draws a very strict line, pointing out like a very good Malthusian that the nation's population is already beyond its capacity, and that a good public possibility uh, good public policy, rather, must, quote, decrease the surplus population. So, Scrooge the Malthusian. Now, there's also Ebenezer Scrooge, uh, who is the hero of the anti-over-commercialized Christmas crowd. Christmas is too commercialized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, just imagine yourself, your own friends, your own family situation. Suppose you were to try cutting back on the number of presents and all of the wrappings and and, and packaging materials that are just going to be thrown away. So suppose you try to cut back significantly on the number of presents that you buy for everyone and see how much emotional grief and blackmail you're going to get. But Billy's getting a new game box, and Robert is buying a new car for his wife. So the advertisers and the Joneses down the street, they all expect us to keep up. But notice Scrooge, he has the intestinal fortitude to overcome such pressures. So we should admire him. We all need more bah humbug in our souls in order to resist selling out to commercialism. In Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, he writes an incredibly crafted and well-argued insight into what postmodernism is, why it exists, and why it is dangerous applied in the wrong dose in the wrong place as it frequently is in this day and age. Postmodernism has been the most vigorous intellectual movement of the late 20th century. In his book, Hicks traces the roots of postmodernism all the way back to the Enlightenment era, where he systematically charts how the age of reason sowed the seeds of unreason that was to follow, 
making a clear connection between postmodernism to history, leftist politics, and even the ugliness of contemporary art. Hicks presents his thesis with beautiful, easy to understand explanations that burn with logic and common sense. So if you've ever wondered why society holds so many assumptions about the world, and you want to understand the chaos of what is happening, Hicks's work in this book provides a huge piece to this puzzle. Why do skeptical and relativistic arguments have such power in the contemporary intellectual world? Why do they have that power in the humanities but not in the sciences? Why is a significant portion of the political left, the same left that traditionally promoted reason, science, equality for all and optimism, now switch to the themes of anti-reason, anti-science, double standards and cynicism? This book is by far the most helpful resource I have ever come across for understanding why the world is turning into a direction that I just can't comprehend. Pick up your copy of Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, available now on Amazon.com. While you're online, make sure to subscribe to the Open College podcast, hosted by Stephen Hicks himself, and please leave a review for it on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now that's uh, six interpretations, uh, and we're having a little bit of fun with them, of course. But all six of those interpretations do have a textual grain of truth. They do also, though, have the defect of taking one element of Scrooge and, in isolation from the rest, stressing it to the limit. So let me do my own picking and choosing from the above, and I want to add a few more elements to the story to uh, give you my take on especially the appealing transformation of Ebenezer Scrooge toward the end of the tale. And I want to pay special attention to the lesson that Scrooge has earned, learned rather by the end of the story. And I give you Scrooge the Aristotelian. Now notice that before his change, and for most of his life, Scrooge is hardly a happy man. He is a miser. But notice that the words miser and miserable keep very close company. A Scrooge undoubtedly gets some pleasure from making good business decisions, and having a positive bottom line in his ledgers. But beyond that, in the rest of his life, he is impoverished, both physically and psychologically. He does not enjoy the company of his employee, Bob Cratchit. And this is the person he spends more time with than anyone else in the world. Further, he is estranged from his family, having rebuffed repeatedly the overtures from his sister's son, friend, Fred rather, and his extended family. Scrooge also on friendship. He has absolutely no friends right, that we know of right, in, the, in the tale. He's completely isolated. Beyond that, he doesn't enjoy travel or the arts. Uh, he doesn't go to galleries and appreciate artistic beauty and interesting things there. He doesn't go to concerts and theatrical performances. He doesn't enjoy tasty food or drink. And in the winter, he is cold. What that is to say is that uh, Scrooge has closed himself off to the vast majority of the things that make human life worth living. He has allowed one genuine value, making money, that's a real value, turn into an obsession. And there are two mistakes here. The mistake is uh, not only that he devotes himself to that one pursuit to the exclusion of other valuable pursuits. It's that he doesn't even allow himself to enjoy fully the rewards that successful money making can bring. And this is what Scrooge comes to realize when the ghosts in succession visit him. They enable him to see the true opportunity costs, the past, present, and future of the choices that he has made. Now, opportunity cost here, for a concept from economics, uh, that means the difference between the values that you do enjoy and the values that you could have enjoyed had you spent your time and money differently. So the ghost of Christmas past visits him and shows him what he was not aware of for much of his life to date, what options he could have pursued, what he missed out on. The ghost of Christmas present shows him what is currently going on, all the real connections and pleasantries and human warmth that are currently happening, but that Scrooge has shut him off from. 
And the ghost of Christmas future shows him where his future path is leading, well, obviously to death, but a lonely grave that's going to be visited only by former businesses acquaintances who will come to his funeral only if free food and drink are provided. If only I had known, Scrooge exclaims to himself when he wakes up, released from the final ghost visit. But he did know, right? not the particulars and the details, but the general life course that he was choosing for himself. And he is now fully conscious and informed. He knows now explicitly that he was choosing. And he knows that he is now in a position of choice and that the present and the future are not yet determined, and that what he decides right now will close off some potentialities and open up and actualize and make real other potentialities. So when the final ghost has released him and Scrooge awakens to a new day, he becomes a philosopher. And at my reading, a kind of Aristotelian philosopher. He realizes that he is alive, and that life is for the living, but in a fully human way. And what does a fully human way mean? Well, it means that he should take pride in his accomplishments in business and the rewards that they bring, fully. He should enjoy the friendship right, of those he spends time with at work and realize that his success and their success are deeply interrelated. He should know that family connections can run rich and deep and reward us with a steady love. He should know that life is a matter of investment, of course, and reinvestment, but in all areas of life, business, friendship, family, food, drink, and culture, and that the greatest satisfactions come to those who invest themselves most liberally. He should realize that millions of his fellow human beings are embarked on that great same project of life and that it really is glorious to have a day set aside to celebrate that fact. Now, to speak of pride and friendship and liberality and an overarching wisdom about how they all contribute to a fully self-realized life, all of that is to make Dickens's Scrooge sound like a Victorian-era reading of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And on my interpretation, the classic status that's enjoyed by A Christmas Carol, it might be due to the combination, of course, of Charles Dickens's storytelling brilliance, but the timeless truths expressed by the wisest of all Greeks. Now, I think we can go one step further. At the end of the Christmas Carol tale, Scrooge is aware that his life change has been profound. And Dickens asks us to dwell upon that. Scrooge knows that many people have mocked him for his transformation, and that in the future, people will mock him for it more. They will remember the old Scrooge, and they will contrast and make fun of him for what he has become. But Scrooge also has the philosophical perspective, and he puts their mockery in proper context. It is never too late to change for the better. It is always the right time to strive for what is truly best in life. Forget the past and sunk costs, as the economists would put it, and having the courage to make the commitments to what you now know is the best possible life, that is what makes possible the strongest self-satisfaction with one's own life. Dickens ends the tale with these wise words about Scrooge, quote, his own heart laughed, and that was quite enough for him, unquote. And for me and the team at Open College Podcast, Merry Christmas, everyone. The host of the Open College podcast, Dr. Stephen Hicks, is a renowned philosopher and author. His field of study and insights into postmodernism explain how it has become one of the most powerful intellectual movements of our time and what that actually means. If you'd like to access more information from Dr. Hicks himself, 
then check out his website at www.stephenhicks.org. You'll be able to find details on his latest publications, courses, and philosophical information concerning business ethics, education, intellectual history, and religion. To stay up to date with the latest from Stephen Hicks himself, make sure you've subscribed to the Open College Podcast feed and follow at Open College Podcast on all your favorite social networks. And while you're online, please leave the show a review on iTunes and Stitcher.